Mr. Henderson making his way to the microphone. So please do come up, sir. <laughs> no, no, please. Wave from the mic. Are you kidding? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Just a couple of very brief comments, and then I'll turn it over to Gary Dara, who's our manager of park planning and design, uh, who will be ably accompanied by uh, Becky Goodall, our park planner designer, who's played a key role in getting this uh, document to you this evening. It's been a long road. Uh, it started off just after I arrived, uh, or actually it started just before I arrived in 2010, and uh, with a couple of starts and stops um, and a considerable, uh, considerable amount of consultation over that uh, time period, uh, I think what is in front of you this evening is a, a document that will allow that piece of land, Cuthbert Homes and the associated Tillicum Park area, to continue and, uh, and be enhanced in the, uh, the, the type of use and the features that it offers and the benefits that it offers to the community. So. Um, I certainly want to thank the, our staff that have done the work along the way and, and then turn it over to Gary now to, uh, to lead us through a, a brief presentation. I don't think he'll want to sit beside you guys either. Thank you, Doug. So I'm going to lead you through a fairly high level presentation and overview of the plan. I, I don't have time to get into a whole lot of details. There is more detail in your council package. Uh, all the material is currently up on our website, so we do have a number of documents there, both the plan itself and, and several supporting documents as well. So I hope you've all had a chance to look at least some of those. And so with that, we'll get into the way. So the purpose of the presentation here, we're going to go briefly over the reasons why we need a plan for the park. I'm also going to give you a, an overview of the site and identify some of the key issues that we grappled with over the past few years. Uh, give you a real brief overview of our public participation process and also uh, go into the goals and key actions which form the core of the plan uh, and also give you a, an overview too of some of the things that we heard from the public as far as input uh, into the plan that you have before you and then talk a little bit at the very end about uh, implementation of the plan. It is a long-term plan. We're looking at probably about a, a 10 year period to fully implement all the action items that are contained in the plan. So why a plan? Well, there was a realization in the community, especially with the uh, Gorge Telecom Community Association, so we have to come in for being a real driving force on getting this project uh, moved to the front and center. Uh, so there was a realization that the park did have a number of significant uh, issues related primarily to the environment and use of the park. There was also a realization too that this was going to be a long-term process to deal with the many uh, involved and complicated issues in the park and that there would be a need for a plan to drive long-term implementation of the action items. And just like to point out that the community did play a very active role in firstly identifying some of the key issues, helping inform the discussion and also providing a great deal of feedback throughout the process. And I think it's really appropriate at this point, too, to recognize all the great uh, contributions that we've had from the community volunteers over the years, uh, primarily with the invasive species removal. We have a pulling together program in the park. We have a friends group which is actively working in the park. And so they've done a, a great deal of work um, in, in helping to deal with some of the significant uh, environmental issues around invasive species. And I think it's also worth noticing, too, all the good work that uh, the volunteers with the fish farms have been doing over the years as well with all their great work around the, uh, the uh, salmon runs. Apologize for the small type. A uh, fair bit of uh, information here to go over with the site overview. Um, the plan itself deals with both Cuthbert Homes Park and Tillicum Park. We often speak of them as though they're a single park, but they're not. They're two separate parks. They have two separate zonings. Cuthbert Homes Park is a P4N zone natural park. And as you can see there, the Tillicum Park is zoned P4HR, which does allow for certain developed facilities such as the rec center and the library. I'll be giving you a site, uh, a site plan uh, on the next slide to help you visualize uh, some of these points here. Uh, 12 hectares of the total area of the park is leased from the PCC, or what was previously the PCC. Sandwich has a lease until 2086, so it is a long-term lease and we do have long-term security over that land. Um, I think I forgot to mention that the overall size of the park is uh, about 25 hectares. 
uh, 63 and a half acres if you're old school. In the past, portions of the site have been used for farming. They have also been used for the deposition of fill associated with some development in the past. Part of the parks in the ALR. It became a Sandwich Park uh, in 1986. Um, and it has been a park since the late 60s, but it just wasn't under our jurisdiction and management. It contains a Centennial Trail, which is a very popular uh, walking trail. The park is very popular with dog walkers, uh, bird watchers, uh, nature lovers, uh, folks that uh, enjoy sort of that wilderness, wild experience, wild in the city. You do get in the park and you do feel like you are uh, in the middle of nature. Uh, the park also has the Colquitts River, basically the, the last one and a half kilometers of the Colquitts before it enters Portage Inlet is in the park. Um, many areas of the park are heavily uh, infested with invasive species, as I've already pointed out. Uh, and the park is extremely popular with uh, local residents within about a 10 to 15 minute distance, and this primarily are the folks that uh, like to walk their dogs, uh, like to just enjoy the, the park locally. We know that because of the uh, consultation and the work that we've been doing. So apologize for the small size of the plan here, but I'll just very quickly go over the land tenure. So this yellow hatched area in here, this parcel and this parcel, uh, is the area that we're leasing from the PCC. The park boundaries basically follow this yellow line here, all the way around, it kind of jig jogs around some road rights of ways follows along the midpoint, really, of the Colquitts River, and then bends around the Colquitts and comes back up around here. So that's Cuthbert Holmes Park. This is Tillicum Park down here. You can see the Colquitts there. That's the last 1.5 kilometers. Very important feature of the Colquitts River through here is the tidal uh, estuary and the mudflats. Very critical habitat for um, nesting birds and uh, feeding birds. Uh, critically important, in fact, as part of the uh, Federal Bird Sanctuary, which encompasses all the Portage Inlet and much of the coastline here uh, on the southern part of the island. Uh, what else? Uh, talked about the P4N zoning. Um, we do have a couple of small A1 uh, zone lots up here, which are kind of historical curiosities. We now have acquired all the residential property that was previously along Adams Road here, so there are no more properties. Um, in this area to acquire. Uh, the plan does talk about ultimately potentially reviewing our park acquisition strategy uh, to look at uh, future acquisitions of land further down along the Colquitts River on the south side of the river. Um, and then this pink purpley area right in here, this is the part that's currently in the ALR. And then there is a small little triangular piece up here which is uh, owned by the BC Transit Financial Authority. Which is kind of curious. I really don't know how that came about, so if anybody has any information on that, that would be useful to know. And then lastly, this part up here of the park is all within the Ministry of uh, Highways uh, Road Right Away for Admirals, or sorry, for the Trans Canada Highway. So you can see the, the right away does extend quite a distance down into the park. I think a lot of folks just assume that that's all parkland up there, but uh, it is not. And then there is a small little covenant area down here, which is um, on Rio Can property. Their property juts into the park here, and there is a small conservation covenant in here where they are required to maintain that uh, piece of land in a natural state. So far, not particularly successful, but we have been talking to them, and, uh, and they are aware of the planning process that we've been working on, and um, we will be working to partner with them in the future uh, on the uh, long-term implementation of the plan. This was some mapping that was done for us by the environmental consultant back in 2011. This was uh, Westland Resources, and uh, very briefly, <clears throat> I'll just quickly go over the zones here. The, the dark colored area that you can see throughout that pretty much follows a lot of the riparian area along the Colquitts, as well as the older mature forest area. Uh, this has all been determined as being quite highly sensitive to human activity, human disturbance. Uh, the Heron Rookery, uh, is in this area here. Now, herons have not been nesting in the park in recent years, but they have left before and they have come back. So it's not out of the bounds of, of possibilities that they might return. We often observe herons down here feeding in the estuary, which is uh, quite a 
a, a nice thing to view. So um, this is uh, clearly a, a sensitive area as well. This kind of yellowy, orangey tone, this is uh, a medium sensitivity area. Uh, it includes some uh, existing vegetation, some tree uh, areas. We have a stand of aspen poplar in here, which is quite rare for this area. Uh, tends to be a little bit more, more robust and resilient to human disturbance. And then we have an area up here, which is low uh, sensitivity, and then this gray area here, which is a bit of a, a no man's land, and I'll show you a bit more on that in a minute. So these are some of the key stakeholders which we consulted over the life of the plan. Uh, we consulted uh, on the IAP2 spectrum at the involve level, so this also included inform, consult, and involve. Uh, some of the key folks here are listed, I won't go through the entire list here, but uh, some of the key ones were Citizen Canine, uh, Pisces, Friends of the Park, uh, GTCA, uh, various Sanitary Advisory Committees, uh, both EMA and PTR. Um, and also the fish fence folks here, so quite, a, quite a, a large group of folks that we have consulted with, and also the, uh, the local schools as well, the middle school and high school area. Some of the part, uh, public, uh, the key public participation opportunities uh, started off with this community mapping exercise in, uh, as Doug mentioned, way back when, uh, May 2010. Um, we had a facilitated public workshop about a year later, and then about another year later we had an open house. These three events in total attracted over 250 participants, which we feel is a, is a fairly good participation rate. We also had a, a public survey um, as part of the open house, and we had 85 responses to that. Uh, lots of different meetings and presentations to various stakeholders and committees in 2013, 2014, and 2015. Um, and most recently, this spring, we did a web-based survey uh, on the current plan that you have in front of you. And uh, we had a pretty good response to that. 215 um, people decided to spend some time going over the material and providing us some feedback. And then as far as some of the, <clears throat> the things we did to raise awareness, uh, we had displays at various community events. Um, there were school presentations and discussions that took place. Uh, thousands of uh, flyers. Um, such as this, were, were mailed out to various residents and stakeholders to make them aware of some of our, our key events over here. Um, we developed a, an email um, contact list so we kept folks involved as much as we could. And then we did things on the web in terms of updates, did some social media work and newspaper ads as well. So tried as hard as we could to provide uh, a meaningful opportunity to people who wanted to participate to participate. Here's an example of some of the work we did on Facebook. We had uh, we reached over 17,000, or almost 17,000 people. We had 80, 482 likes and 30 comments. And most of the comments had to do with the uh, the owl. People love the owl. <laughs> so the key issues. There's quite a few of them. Establishing key locations and priorities for protecting natural areas and wildlife. Invasive species. Talked about that already. Uh, infrastructure and public amenities. Currently the park doesn't have a lot of public amenities. so the infrastructure is getting old and worn out, so there are need for some capital improvements. Wayfinding and orientation is a big problem. We heard a lot of feedback about that. People get into the middle of the park and they're, they feel hopelessly lost. If you don't know the park, it's really easy to get turned around. And given the, uh, some of the dense vegetation and lack of sight lines, it, it can be a little intimidating for folks if they don't know where they are. Safety and security, kind of related to the wayfinding orientation. This, this has more to do with some of the camping activity that historically has, has been ongoing. Dog management, mentioned a little bit about that already. We all know the dog owners are very passionate people. Another, uh, another fairly good sized body of work in the planning process was identifying well, what kind of recreation activities are suitable in a P4N park such as this. We had some various proposals come uh, before us and were explored during the public um, engagement uh, process. And so an example there was the BM bike, BMX bike community came out in the public department with a great uh, setting for, for a BMX uh, facility. Lots of impacts from off-trail use in sensitive areas, talks a little bit about that already. Um, but those impacts are being caused primarily by people walking off-trail 
cyclists riding off trail and, uh, and pet owners allowing their pets to run off trail as well. And recreational boating on the Colpus River. It, uh, it is becoming a concern. The level of boat traffic is increasing. Uh, we have noted that uh, at times in the summer when the water levels are quite shallow, boats are still continuing to go up the cold quits and there is some disturbance of the, uh, the nesting waterfowl uh, interrupting their feeding and <coughs> nesting uh, habits. So we're hearing quite a bit about this issue from uh, folks like GWI uh, and the uh, fish fence folks. And another interesting problem, which is really difficult to get a handle on, is the, this whole issue of the informal boat trails. I'll show you a plan that uh, basically really illustrates the, the extent of the problem. And then lastly, but not least, very recently, the Mackenzie Interchange has come up and will no doubt impact the park in some way, particularly that northwest corner. We obviously don't have any plans uh, to comment on yet, but the, the plan does speak a little bit uh, to some of the high level things that uh, we need to be vigilant and aware of uh, as part of any uh, Senate review of that proposal and when we do see it. So this is a graphic that <clears throat> pretty clearly illustrates the go growing problem with the uh, goat trails. The thick purple lines here, or th thicker or darker purple lines if you can see them here, these are parts of the formal trail system. This is the main paved trail that forms a part of the Colquitts uh, trail extension which leads out to the parking area here, which is the key um, sort of trailhead in the park. And then all these other little spidery type lines, these are all informal goat trails that have been created over the years by either folks looking for safe places to camp, or, um, or dogs running off trail into the bush, a whole variety of reasons. And um, there's probably, I wouldn't say 100 kilometers of unofficial trails in the park, but there are a lot. And this mapping was actually done in 2008, so no doubt the problem has actually gotten worse. It hasn't gotten better. This is a really interesting air photo from 1966 that shows the site shortly uh, before it became a park. Um, they will drive in here, which uh, is where Tilica Mall currently sits. Um, you can see evidence of some of the cleared fields in here uh, that were used for agriculture. Um, Interesting to note that the, the extent of the forest cover has probably increased 25 to 30 percent since 1966 with the uh, abandonment of, of farming on the site. Uh, there's absolutely no infrastructure, no facilities or anything in here. Uh, no pathways, no parking lots of any kind. Um, this is a really interesting area up here. It's, uh, it's some kind of construction spoil that was deposited in the park. We don't know by who. Uh, we think it happened sometime between the late 1950s and early 60s. It starts to show up in the late 50s on air photos. Um, and this does coincide with that area on the environmental mapping that basically says not sensitive at all. It's a bit of a no man's land. Uh, it's very, currently it's very heavily infested with invasive plants, but we do see some opportunities there and the plan does speak to that a little bit. The rec center, just again for a bit of orientation, so the rec center would be right about down in this area here. So lots of changes in 50 years. The key goals and, uh, and action steps which support them are as follows. The first goal is to protect and restore natural areas. The second goal is to provide recreational opportunities that complement the park's natural character. Improve the trail system to support recreational use and environmental conservation. And lastly, improve the sense of safety and security for park visitors without compromising the natural character of the park and really what that is speaking to is, is the whole notion, sometimes we'll see in septet design principles, they'll say, well, in order to make a trail feel safe, you have to clear out all the vegetation and the understory to open up sight lines. Well, we're not going to do that. Um, there may be some select areas where we may um, do that, especially those areas where we're removing invasive plants. But for the most part, we are going to retain the natural character of the park as much as we can. It is the thing that people love most about that park. So, a lot, oh, sorry, I should just go back there for a minute. It's worth mentioning, too, that for each of these goals, there are a number of action steps designed to help uh, uh, fulfill those goals. Most of those, or many of those action steps are in your uh, staff report, and there are more in the actual management plan itself. I won't go into those uh, in this presentation. The concept plan, basically, um, we've looked at the park, um, based on a variety of key zones. 
The first one here, the, the green one labeled number one, this is the area primarily <clears throat> buffering the uh, heron rookery. It is in this area. And we are, it is a blue listed species. So we are required to undertake management steps to uh, protect <coughs> the rookery. And even the nests, we have to take steps to protect them as well. So minimal involvement and probably a whole lot more buffer planting around the, uh, the current heron rookery, again, to just provide a bit more of a barrier, a bit more of a buffer. Herons do like, well, they're interesting creatures because the province has mandated some pretty large buffers around heron rookeries, but if, if you happen to go to Beacon Hill Park and you've seen the heron rookery about 50 feet off of Douglas, <laughs> Douglas is a very busy street, there's buses going up and down, there's fire engines going up and down, and yet the rookery, the, uh, the herons still seem to have adapted pretty well to a pretty urban setting. But, uh, but in this area, that's not the case, much more national environment, so we do want to maintain the integrity of those kinds of recommended buffers. Um, number two, this area here, down along the Colquitts River, our main asphalt pathway actually does come down into the riparian area and is very close to the, to the Colquitts. It does flood quite often in the winter. The surface is breaking down and wearing out, so what we're advocating in the plan is to actually uh, remove it located a little further uphill um, and resurface it and then do some restoration work down in here uh, to basically clean it up and, uh, and kind of rebuild the, the uh, integrity of the riparian area there. Um, this area here, I haven't talked about this yet, but what the plan advocates is removing the invasive uh, English hawthorn thicket. It's not the native hawthorn, it's the invasives. And if you've been down to the park, you'll see just how extensive and dense this is. It's about three acres in size, and it's almost an impenetrable wall in there. And it is a place where we do have a lot of uh, the camping activity going on. So the idea there is, is to remove the thicket and to replace it with uh, more of an informal open recreation space so that if folks do want to run their dogs uh, off leash, um, on, off the trail, they're certainly welcome to do that. Uh, the intent here too is also to create a bit of an open destination area as well so that folks, if they want to spend some more time in the park, they can, they can do that. Right now folks tend to just walk through the park and they don't linger there very long and that's really not a healthy situation for, for parks. It's good to have people in your parks and spending some time there. So we're hoping that that will help fulfill that function. Uh, and then number four, this is that sort of barren area <clears throat> near the highway. We see that as a great opportunity. It's a nice big site to do some, uh, some future urban forestry establishment work. Uh, we're always challenged and looking for large sites to, to do urban forestry work, so we see this as a, as a real good, uh, good opportunity here. And then these uh, dashed yellow lines that you see throughout the, uh, the concept plan, really what this is, it's taking some of those informal go trails and formalizing them and making them more of the, uh, of the part of the uh, trail system. There's clear desire lines. These are some of the more significant ones, and park visitors are telling us something that, hey, there should be a trail here. You know, we're using it. It takes us from one point to another. Um, so this, I should point out that this is conceptual. There's still a lot of ground truthing work that would have to take place to make sure that, yes, the trails that we've identified in this area for formalization are actually the right ones, because there's probably a dozen or so just in here, and so we just have to make sure that, uh, that we uh, do much more due diligence in terms of specifically identifying which ones, but I think this con conveys the, the, the notion about what our intent there is to build some better connections up along the, you know, the pathway south of the highway, new pathway connection down here at the west end of the park off of Admirals, so we'll be building a new entryway into the park. Um, I think that probably deals with most of those. And then within the large green area, this is um, it's still a high priority zone. This is where our mature um, forest cover is. It includes much of the riparian area on the Colquitts. So within this green area, there will still be many, many different site-specific restoration work um, going on, but more detailed plans will have to be developed for specific sites, and we have criteria in the, uh, in the plan and in the appendices that uh, that illustrate how we uh, intend to do that. In fact, we have already identified some of the highest priority areas in here for restoration work. And then this just um, conceptually shows our intent to improve some of the amenities and infrastructure in the park. So I won't go into all of these little symbols here because you probably can't see them anyways. 
Um, but we are going to be doing a whole lot more work in terms of uh, improving visitor orientation so that when you enter the park at some of these key entrances, such as this one and this one, this one over here, uh, this one here off of Dysart. Um, if any of you have seen some of our large kiosks in the park system that have our late finding maps and kind of you are here and you need to take this trail if you want to go there, that kind of thing. So much more extensive um, uh, trail information, information about the park. Uh, we've got a whole interpretive sign program laid out. That's the big piece of our educational program because we think there is the need to do, pardon me, much more work in the way of education and interpretation. Typically, I think that, you know, folks, everybody wants to be near the water, but I think they don't, sometimes don't understand what unregulated access to the water's edge creates. And there are areas down here along the bank of the coal cliffs where all the vegetation is gone. It's just been denuded uh, because of all that. Or, you know, keep hitting that button. Um, so we do intend to do a lot more um, education in the park. And so, uh, again, some of you have seen our, our interpretive signs as well. Uh, we, we are getting quite good at that, and we are going to be doing a little comprehensive uh, package in the park. Uh, new park benches in places, creating some new viewpoint opportunities at key locations. Some garbage cans, doggy bags, those kinds of things. So some of the kind of bread and butter, nuts and bolts sort of things that uh, that large parks like this should have. Some of the feedback that we got, uh, as I said, we had 215 responses. The vision statement that is in your council report and in the plan itself it was very strongly supported. If you add up the strongly support and somewhat support, we're up at about 97%. I think that's probably about as good as we're ever going to get <laughs> as far as support on initiative. Similar with the National Area Actions, uh, very strong support. Trails Actions, uh, very strong support as well. And Recreation Actions, uh, again, you know, we're trending around late or high 80s, uh, low 90s percent support level. And then our, uh, our action items and goals around safety and security are also very highly supported. And then some of the additional feedback, this was sort of the, uh, the open-end comments that people provided in the March-April survey. So you can see the uh, people, definitely, and we've grouped them basically by themes. We went through and we combed through all of the comments and we grouped them according to the themes. So people certainly value the park and wildlife features. They want it to be kept a natural park, an informal park. Uh, lots of comments about dogs. They want the park to remain dog friendly. Uh, opposition to lease restrictions. Support of our voluntary stay on the trail management strategy. And I really haven't talked about that too much, other than rather than taking a punitive approach at the beginning, in terms of really getting heavy with people, allowing their dogs to be running around the park out of control. We're going to work on the messaging and awareness, working with Citizen K9 to spread the word. Uh, about the importance to, you know, please keep your dogs on trails in the highly sensitive areas. And we'll do some more messaging around that in the parks as well. Uh, and safety again comes up. Uh, comments about acquiring land. Uh, we should be more actively or more proactively doing that for the park. Education talked about that. Um, and more emphasis on. Uh, raising awareness around the mud flat, the estuary, and the federal bird sanctuary. And something there about restoring some of the, uh, the old residential roads and driveways. Some of them still have asphalt in the park, so we need to do some work on cleaning those up. And then how the uh, Trans-Canada Highways Admiral Road intersection improvements will be mitigated. So we talked a little bit about that at the beginning, and we think we have some general ideas, but, uh, but as yet we don't have anything specific to react to. And then the issue around a basic plan, so either harmful one should be removed. And then very quickly, we do have a 10-year outlook on our management plan. We've broken it down into the first three years, the middle three years, and then the final four years. So short, mid, and long term. And each of the action items, so the action items in the one to three years will deal with all of these at the same time. And similarly in the midterm actions. The action items will deal with all of these at the same time, and hopefully by the time we get into year seven and year eight, we're starting to make some real improvements. And then some of these other, <coughs> some of these other things, such as the land acquisitions and the overpass, really can't be slotted in, into a specific uh, phase. We basically, just deal with them as the opportunities arise. 
So that's the end of the formal presentation. Beck and I will do our best to answer any questions you might have. So, Council, what I thought I might do, uh, is, given the thoroughness of the presentation, is give the opportunity to the audience to ask their questions, provide us with feedback, and then we can kind of do the questions and comments all at one time. If you okay. Don't mind. Sure. Uh, so, thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Dara. That was very, uh, uh, very informative in terms of uh, the process and, and actions and, and uh, goals for, for what's going to take place here. Thank you very much. Um, so, you, uh, you heard me introduce that. If you'd like to come up and give Council the benefit of your, uh, your comments, feedback, and questions, we'd love to hear from you. Mr. Wixon. You already know me. I'm Rob Wixon, 2836 Inez Drive. I'm here as President of the Community Association of Rose Tillica. I don't know if any of you know, but I understand that the park actually became a park after a development proposal for a seniors living facility was turned down. Uh, and it had to do with the Mackenzie inter intersection. They wanted to put more seniors housing up there. And we do have some supportive housing on the other side of the road, on, the, on Portage Road. But uh, it's very interesting that one of my neighbors who lived in the neighborhood for 45 years said that that's what got her involved in the community association preventing that from being developed. Uh, this was a long, careful process. Uh, it was a chance to bring various elements of the community together. And it's always interesting when you get to an opportunity to bring people to a table with very divergent views. And so we had our first discussion, and lots of ideas were thrown out there. It was quite interesting. And we had the ideas of the DMX use, and we had the ideas of you know, restricting use, and so on and so forth.